In the last few videos, we dealt with some heavy topics. From dealing with the events of the Great Tribulation, to understanding the Whore Babylon, and then dealing with the subject of Mystery Babylon, the end times nation who will receive judgment in one hour. All these subjects are deep and they are very much needed in order to understand the times that we're in right now. We are in the last days and if you're kingdom minded and focused on living in the truth, you will be ready for what is coming to this world and this series, now in part 15, is walking you down through all these biblical topics about the end times so that there is a study that you can refer back to in order to really grasp the most important time in the history of this world that's coming. So yeah, we dealt with some heavy topics. In the last five or six parts, we dealt with the satanic agendas like the Antichrist, the one world government, and the one world religion. Then we dealt with the tribulation period and the prophecies of judgment against Babylon. And all these topics are things that will happen in the near future. Like when we deal with the satanic agendas, we can easily see how they have been preparing us for these things. We have been conditioned to accept these agendas. And right now they are waiting to bring about the right crisis in order that those attached to their world can be drawn into their web. You will see that everything that is happening in this world is being orchestrated and conducted so that the world will be steered into the hands of the beast. When you know the goal, you can see very clearly how they are hurting the masses. And the most beautiful thing is that we all have been given an escape route that does not make us have to go down with these satanic agendas. And if we focus on the truth and live in reality, we can be set free and prepare for what truly matters. These videos are a recruitment for the Assembly of Philadelphia, who will be guarded and kept when this world turns. And it requires that each of us submit to Yah in truth and prepare ourselves for him mentally and physically, but most of all, spiritually. When you approach the world from an understanding of Bible prophecy, you can feel confidence that no matter how bad things get, as long as you stand firm in your faith, you will come out victorious. He gave us this prophecy to prepare us and let us always know that He is in control. This world is spiraling towards hell and we must stay off of its path and move the other way. As we have went through this series, we see that the Great Tribulation will be the worst time in the history of the world. The opening of the seals, the blowing of the trumpets, and the pouring of the bowl judgments all bring in terrible events. And it all leads to two events. The Marriage Supper of the Lamb and the Battle of Armageddon. The Marriage Supper of the Lamb is so important because of the many false teachings that have been spread in regards to it. And the Battle of Armageddon is so important because it's the final event that happens before Yahusha's millennial reign comes. And it may surprise you to know how they have been preparing us for this battle right to this present day, and most don't see it. So what we need to do as we continue on in this series is break it all down. We will deal with the Marriage Supper of the Lamb first because it seriously is attached with massive false teachings. And if you're going to be ready, it's important that this is dealt with. So we will discuss the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. Let's begin. Okay, so the question may be for many is, what is the Marriage Supper of the Lamb? Before we discuss it, as we always do, let's go to the scriptures and read what Yah has prophesied. We go to Revelation chapter 19. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to Yahuwah our Elohim. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Again they said, Hallelujah! Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped Elohim who sat on the throne saying, Amen! Hallelujah! Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our Elohim, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as a sound of many waters, and as a sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for Yahuwah El Shaddai reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage supper of the Lamb has come. His wife has made herself ready, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of Elohim. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. 
I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Yahusha. Worship Elohim, for the testimony of Yahusha is the spirit of prophecy. That's Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. And from these 10 verses, there has been major doctrines that have been created from this. These 10 verses right here give us what we know of the marriage supper of the Lamb. The first five verses of this chapter begin with showing the response in heaven of the judgment of the harlot that was spoken of in chapter 17 and 18. This was spoken of in part 13 and 14 of the series. The multitude in heaven praises Yah for judging the great whore, the harlot of Babylon, and avenging the blood of the martyrs, which, if you remember in chapter 7, we saw the martyrs pleading to Yah to be avenged. But they're praising Yah for his judgment against Mystery Babylon. This right here takes place at the end of the Great Tribulation. The rebellion that had begun in the Garden of Eden is finally ended. Never again will there be more false religions, worldly philosophy, injustice, or unrighteousness. Hallelujah. And we see continuous praise in heaven because of this. We never want to be on the wrong side of this judgment. Now, I love this chapter because of the next part that we find in verses 6 through 10. This is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, before I get deep into it, let's discuss what this is speaking about. You see, all throughout scripture, you will hear Yahusha being referenced as the bridegroom. A bridegroom is a man on his wedding day, or just before and after the event. He is the husband-to-be. Some examples of this you can find in Matthew chapter 9, verse 15, when Yahusha refers to himself as the bridegroom. And Yahusha said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. That's Matthew chapter 9, verse 15. And in John chapter 3, verse 29, when John was disputing with the Yahudim, he explained that he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. You see, he was talking about Yahusha. Yahusha has the bride. He is the bridegroom. The wife or bride of Messiah is the assembly, the church of believers of Israel. This is his body of believers all around the world. It's not a physical building or some organization, not some denomination or anything like that. It's the collective group of believers around the world that believe in the gospel and live through the word and keep the commandments. Again, as John chapter 3 verse 29 alludes, the bridegroom has the bride. Yahusha himself shows us this relationship in parables like the parable of the ten virgins. That's in Matthew 25. We'll go over that later. And this shows the virgins being ready for the bridegroom. As Paul talks to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 2, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Messiah. And also, as explained in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, when husbands are charged to love their wives, just as also Messiah loved the church and gave himself for her. The church is the bride of Messiah. So in this chapter of Revelation, we see the marriage of the Lamb and the wedding supper. Verse 7 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. His assembly has been made ready for him. You see, the marriage of the Lamb is the eternal union of the church with Messiah. The fine linen, clean and white, noted in verse 8, represents the righteousness of the church, which has now been judged and purified at the judgment seat of Messiah. You see, in ancient times, a marriage was the single greatest celebration and social event in the biblical world. Preparations and celebrations were much more elaborate than those of today and they also lasted much longer. That's why this is called a marriage supper. This provides us with an understanding of just how significant this event is. The same imagery of a Hebrew wedding pictures Yahusha's relationship with his church. A Hebrew wedding consisted of three phases, the betrothal, the presentation, and the ceremony. The first part, like I said, is the betrothal, which is like the engagement. This was an arrangement by both sets of parents It was legally binding and could only be broken by divorce. It's a mutual promise or contract for a future marriage. The assembly was betrothed to Messiah from before the foundation of the world, as Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says. 
It says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. You see, this marriage has been established since Yahuwah made his covenant with Abraham. And if you remember, this is how he started this series from part one. We are his chosen generation, his royal priesthood that he has chosen since the beginning. The next phase was the time of preparation as the groom prepared for his bride. As we see Yahusha say in John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. You see, the presentation was a time of festivities just before the actual ceremony. You remember, just thinking about the wedding where Yahusha turned water into wine, those festivities could last up to a week and sometimes even more depending on the economic or social status of the bride and groom. But this preparation time is also about the bride preparing herself for the groom. And this is what we all have been doing since Yahusha left. We have been preparing ourselves for him. But there will be a time when he comes and there will be people not ready and not accepted. Again, Yahusha prophesies of this in Matthew 25. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go, rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding. And the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came, also saying, Adonai, Adonai, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. And so this is the period that we're in right now. We are waiting for the bridegroom. When he comes, the foolish ones who did not keep enough oil in their lamps, they will be rejected. Now, verse 9 of Revelation 19, it's an important verse. It says, Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of Elohim. And this is so big to understand. Now, here's the thing. There have been a lot of doctrine that has been created about this event of the marriage supper. And many false understandings have been attached to this event. Primarily what I'm speaking about is the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine. And because of this, there is a great deal of confusion and falsehoods that have been presented. The false doctrines surrounding the pre-tribulation rapture have been tied into this marriage supper of the Lamb. So I know what I'm dealing with. I understand that as I speak about this, there are many that are not going to be happy because they want to believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. But in order for you to hear me out, let me just prove first that the marriage supper of the Lamb has nothing to do with the pre-tribulation rapture. Let me get that out the way. And let's make a deal that if you can see this evidence clearly, maybe you will then listen a little bit more to understand what I explain before you decide to turn me off completely. You see, there are so many people that still believe in this pre-tribulation rapture doctrine simply because the moment they hear anyone speak against that doctrine, they simply just turn them off. But the thing is that if this is what you believe and you believe it's truth, it should be able to stand against challenges, should it not? Why is this belief so fragile that it cannot stand against people who challenge it? Either way, let me prove that it has nothing to do with the marriage supper of the Lamb. Question. According to scripture, when does the marriage supper of the Lamb occur? Now, if we want to apply the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine to this, this would mean that it would have had to happen at the time before the tribulation starts, right? Hence why it's called pre-tribulation. But look, according to scripture, when does the marriage supper of the Lamb actually start? Look at what they're celebrating. A great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, 
Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to Yahuwah our Elohim. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Again they said, Hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. That's verses 1-3 through three of Revelation 19, and showing them rejoicing for Yah's judgment against Mystery Babylon. Her smoke rises up, and they are rejoicing because of her judgment. So this marriage supper of the Lamb does not happen before the tribulation, but during the tribulation when Babylon is finally judged. So if you just recognize that point right there, which is plain to see, it should be something that brings attention to the fact that there is something missing or wrong from that pre-tribulation rapture doctrine. So please continue to listen as I explain it. Cool. Understand that the marriage supper of the Lamb, it's a wonderful event, and those who are called to it are blessed, but it should not be tied to the rapture. The rapture event that everyone is looking for, when those are caught up to the clouds, all this happens when Yahusha comes back, not before. This event of the marriage supper of the Lamb happens in heaven. If you're tied to the pre-tribulation rapture, I have done a complete video breaking down the falsehood of this doctrine, and I have a playlist dealing with this. You should watch these videos. But let me deal with this as simply as possible because I have seen that there are many that are new to this channel and that have started this end time series but have not gotten to the point of understanding about the pre-tribulation rapture. So let me explain this as simple as possible. You see, I ask everyone the same question when they talk about the pre-tribulation rapture and most never really want to answer it because it totally breaks down this pre-tribulation rapture belief. The question is, who gets taken first, the wheat or the tares? You see, Yahusha has explained this in his parable about the wheat and tares, and if you just apply what he has said, then it does not allow for belief in the pre-tribulation rapture. We will go over the parable of the wheat and the tares. Another parable he put forth to them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us to then go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, First, gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. That's Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30. He then continues later. Then Yahusha sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sold them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let them hear. That's Matthew chapter 13, verses 36 to 43. So back to the question. Who was gathered first at the end of the age at the harvest? He said he let the wheat and tares grow together. But at the time of the harvest, which is the end of the age, he will say to the reapers, First, gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. The answer is clear. The sons of the wicked are gathered first. You see, he is not plucking out the righteous. He is plucking out the wicked. This is what he said he would do first. So now that you understand that, let's now go to this scripture that is widely used and very much misunderstood as well. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, 
and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. The two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour you are done is coming. That's Matthew chapter 24, verses 37 through 42. Of what was just read, verse 40 and 41 say, Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. And these verses are used for people to justify the rapture. But after we just went over the explanation about the wheat and the tares, it should be very clear how false that is. He spoke about this as the days of Noah and people will be taken. You see, the doctrines of men have made the majority think that those who are taken and plucked out are the blessed ones, when in fact, those who are being taken are the ones being gathered for judgment. They are tares. You don't want to be plucked off this earth. You want to inherit this earth and be left to reap in all the blessings Yahuwah has for us. So the plot twist, everyone following the wicked deceptions of Satan and the doctrines of men are asking to be counted among the wicked because they're not studying to show themselves approved. They're asking to be tares. The tares are taken and plucked out first. So you believing in doctrine that's saying that you're going to be plucked out first is a direct contradiction to Yahusha's words and his parables. You cannot believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, believing the church will be plucked out first, when Yahusha has himself said that it's the tares that are taken first. And this is me explaining it as simple as possible. I again have gone much more in depth on this subject in many videos. If you want to study it further, go to the playlist. But in the end, you can believe what you want. What I'm saying is that it's a huge danger to believe in doctrine that the Messiah you say you believe in has given clear scripture about. He has said that the tares are taken first, so you should believe him. But with all that said, this brings us back to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So now that this understood that this is not about the pre-tribulation rapture, I guess the question is, if this is not about the pre-tribulation rapture, then who is here at the marriage supper? Well, here's the deal. And before I get into it all, I think it's very important to really understand this. What people have done with the Bible and the scriptures is very reckless. They have taken the things that our Father has not clearly explained and provided clarity on. They have taken those things and there are people that love to make up their own views to prove how smart they are and they create their own doctrines. And being that we have been born into much of these influences and it just sounds like they've been around so long, it is possible that we ourselves get sucked up into those falsehoods as well. So as we recommit to our Father and prepare ourselves, it's important to not treat the word so recklessly and we deal with what our Father has actually told us and we do not create additions to the prophecy or subtractions. He has warned us about that at the end of this book. He says, For I testify to everyone who hears the word of prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, Elohim will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of prophecy, Elohim shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. That's Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. So with that warning given, go back to what was said about the marriage supper and notice, there is no discussion about the pre-tribulation rapture in any of these scriptures. None of that doctrine is discussed. And therefore, people are adding to the words of prophecy and they're playing a very dangerous game that you should not take a part in. Let's deal with the marriage supper right now. Verse 8 says, And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So based on this information, we can go back to what was written earlier in the same book and see who else was dressed like this. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 6, when the fifth seal is open in verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of Elohim and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Adonai, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were, was completed. Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. You see, these were the souls of the martyrs that were slain, crying for judgment. 
Now, they were not wearing linen, but they are wearing robes, but they are white. What is said next after that is really what I want to focus on. It's the most important thing. In verse 11, it says, Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who will be killed as they were, was completed. You see, these martyrs, they were crying out for vengeance, but they were told to wait a little while longer until what? Until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who will be killed as they were, was completed. Okay, so you get that? And so what is happening at the marriage supper of the Lamb? It says, After these things I heard a loud voice of great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to Yahuwah our Elohim. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. And he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. You see, they are praising Yahuwah for the vengeance he has finally taken out. At Revelation chapter 6, they were crying for judgment. At Revelation 19, they were praising Yah for him carrying it out. And after the final number of their fellow servants and their brethren who will be killed as they were were completed, the bride was ready to be joined to Messiah. You see, this is not an event about the rapture, but it is a description of the promise and the blessed hope. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For Elohim did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Adun, Yahushua the Messiah, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 8-11. through 11. Also, it is said in the next chapter of Revelation, Revelation chapter 20, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Yahusha and for the word of Elohim, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Messiah for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of Elohim and a Messiah and shall reign with him a thousand years. It's Revelation chapter 20 verses 4 through 6. You see, whether we wake or we sleep, we will live together with Messiah. This is the blessed hope. This is the promise. And therefore, those who die during the tribulation will be blessed and come back and reign with Messiah. This is all that we know. So here's the deal. On earth, during this period of Armageddon, Israel, they have been gathered and they're waiting for the kingdom to come. We went over that earlier in this series. This is what most of us are waiting for. We are waiting for the gathering. But there will be saints that are not gathered with us and many of them will deal with persecution as the beast comes to persecute them, as Revelation chapter 12 prophesies. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keeps the commandments of Elohim and had the testimony of Yahusha the Messiah. As Revelation chapter 12 verse 17. Then also it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Revelation chapter 13, verse 7. You see, the beast is coming after the saints and they will be persecuted. How I see this personally is that there are a great deal of believers in this world that love Yah and are trying to keep the commandments. But there are certain truths that many have not been willing to accept. When Yah gathers Israel and pleads his case with us, many that denied certain truths will not be ready and they will not be a part of the gathering and they will have to deal with persecution. Just because they rejected certain truths does not mean that they were rejected completely, but they will be tested. This is how I see it, but I cannot say that this is 100% what happens. I mean, I don't know. We know that there will be many in the assembly that needs testing because they were not counted as a part of the assembly of Philadelphia, and the beast will persecute them. What I know is my desire to be a part of the assembly of Philadelphia, and in order for that to be, I know I must live in the truth, I must keep his commandments, and I must persevere. And that's what I'm focused on. But the thing is that I know regardless of whether I make it through the tribulation or I pass, 
I will come to reign with Messiah, and that truth gives me confidence and conviction. So again, back to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let's read it one more time. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thunderings, saying, Hallelujah, for Yahuwah El Shaddai reigns. Let us be glad and reign and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of Elohim. Revelation chapter 19 verses 6 through 9. And this is how we should be looking at it. What is actually saying. Nothing more, nothing less. This is the final number of saints that have been prepared for the kingdom and the bridegroom Yahusha has now joined with her. The bride is now ready. Those that are in heaven that are a part of the wedding ceremony, we will see in the next verses, they will come down as an army with Messiah, defeat the beast and establish the reign of Messiah's kingdom. The marriage supper of the land is joining a Messiah with his assembly and it's a beautiful event. It completely ties in how he started this series in part one with the Abrahamic covenant. It brings it full circle as a fulfillment of the covenant that Yah made with Abraham. This event should not be put together with the pre-tribulation rapture. We don't need to do all that with the word. Read it for yourself and do not add or take anything away from it. This event is noted in Revelation because of what it signifies, which is the bridegroom joining with the bride, which is the promise. And when this is finally done, this is when Yahusha is ready to come down and reign. This is not about bringing the church all into heaven and then bringing us right back down. That is a falsehood and it should not be applied. This is about Yahusha joining himself to his bride who has now been made ready. And this is who we are and what we're doing. This is a part of the assurance and promise for those that whether we wake or we sleep, we will reign with Messiah. This is a part of knowing that all of the troubles in this world with persecution and tribulation are now over and the bride is now ready to come into the kingdom. This is a wonderful thing, and when you read it, you will see that it made John praise, and he even bowed to the angel because of the awe that he was in. This marriage supper of the Lamb is the eternal union of the church with Messiah, our true king. This marriage supper is the final event that will take place right before the establishment of our Messiah's millennial kingdom. Do not add doctrines of men that are not clearly told to you. Apply what is said and do not add to it in order to make your own theology fit. That is a dangerous activity. In regards to the end times, this event is major because it signifies the end of wickedness and the reign of the righteous. And if you do not make it through the tribulation, but you are counted as one of the final number of saints that must be persecuted through the tribulation, know that when you are a part of this marriage supper of the Lamb, you will be blessed. At the end of the day, what it is that we all must do is endure to the end. We must stay kingdom minded and we must persevere. It is not a time for games and it's not a time to play with our souls. We must stay focused on living in the truth and submit to Yah and his will. I know most in Christianity tie the marriage supper of the Lamb with that pre-tribulation rapture doctrine. Please purge yourself from these falsehoods and doctrines of men and just make sure you are ready and you're committed to Yah. Keep the commandments and make Yahuwah the priority of your life. Be kingdom minded and focus on being a part of the promises. Live in the truth, and when these prophetic events happen, you will be blessed. Always know, the most important thing that you can do right now is be ready. So make sure that you are, and be blessed. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. Okay, thanks again for watching. If this has blessed you, please don't forget to like this and share this video with others. If you have not done so already, please don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Y'all willing, I upload every Friday. Also, please don't forget to follow this ministry on Facebook and Instagram, as well as on my website, truthunedited.com. As always, let me thank all those who support this ministry. You know who you are. Your contributions are an extreme blessing to this ministry, and I'm very thankful for you. Your support is truly humbling. You really have no idea how you have helped this ministry. Thank you for being a blessing. 
Be blessed. Okay. Thanks again, everyone, for watching. I love you all.